For two reasons, we're going to start right on time. So those of you who are getting food, go ahead, enjoy it, and come over. Um, as you know, we have two speakers today. That's one reason. And the second reason is that we are live streaming. So for those who are watching us online, it's fair that we start on time. So today, we're going to talk about assessment of cardiac function, mostly left ventricular function, both from the traditional ejection fraction volume uh, point of view, as well as from the hemodynamic side. So I, I will present the two-dimensional um, parameters that we use for evaluating the left ventricle, and Dr. Naga will talk about the Doppler hemodynamics. So we do this every day. We just came from the echo, uh, reading a bunch of echoes, and roughly about 70 to 80 percent of requests for echo on a daily basis relate to ventricular function. Both global function as well as regional function, we'll be talking about wall motion and regional function at a, sec at a later time. So we do this often, and the truth is that this is one of the most difficult things we do in echo. Um, often we estimate, and the estimation can have its own problems. So uh, this is the uh, document that I think all the fellows are familiar with, um, published just a few years back. It was an update from previous documents looking at measurements of cardiac, uh, different cardiac measurements, and also uh, how to do volumes, ejection fraction, left ventricular mass, and so on. So if you show these two images to anybody, even a 15-year-old, they will rapidly see that they're different. And it would not be that difficult to train the eye to see that this looks very normal and this looks big and bad. So at the extremes, um, it's easy. Now, one of the things that is nice to use the extremes for is to ask ourselves the question, why is it that we see this difference so easily? What is it that we are actually looking at? And if you look at these two images, we are seeing that in the normal heart, if you imagine a bunch of diameters here, the shortening fraction of those diameters is very good. The shortening fraction of the entire cavity area that we see is very good, in contrast to here, where both the shortening fraction of imaginary diameters that you could run around here are all bad, and the overall shortening fraction of the whole cavity as we see it is pretty bad. So the eye catches that very fast and very quick. In addition, notice this mitral valve opens and at peak opening has a big distance with the septum. We'll come back to that later. While this one opens very nicely and almost touches the septum. However, when we see a heart like this, you know, it's not quite so easy. This is not a very big heart. Uh, you have some mitral annular calcification, so it's probably an elderly person. And, you know, what's the EF there? So I can tell you that this type of echoes we have shown to groups of 100 plus cardiologists in the audience, and when we use the audience response system, we get something like this. Some people say it's in the 60s. The majority are somewhere between 30 and 50, and even some go to 20s. If you're the patient, which one would you like? So this is a spread. This was taken actually from an actual course that we presented data you know, pictures like this to 100 plus cardiologists, practicing cardiologists who do echo every single day. So, it, you know, if you wanted better proof that we do have some problems estimating EF, I, I could not give you anything better than that. We still estimate because for many reasons, sometimes quanti quantitation is not possible. Quality of echoes, volume of echoes you're reading, I mean, and so on. But the truth is that if you're going to estimate, you better learn and be good at it because your patient deserves that. So going back to what is it that we use? So we talk about cavity shortening fraction, and we can do that also in the short axis. Dimensional shortening fractions, you know, you, you can draw a bunch of diameters in your eye looking at the cavity. The center of the base, very important. So the, the long axis shortens with systole primarily because of a little bit of contraction of the apex, but also a lot of annular descent to the base. 
And you can see that in this case, that's kind of not that great. Um, normally, it should be more than one centimeters and ideally even 1.5 centimeter. So this is another thing that you can use with your eye. And then that mitral septal separation, which I showed you earlier, it works nicely when you have dilated ventricles. However, when the ventricles are normal, like this one, for example, you have a very nice opening of the mitral valve. Still, some of you may be concerned with the EF of this patient. So I'll give you a few more seconds so in your own mind you make your own estimate. We don't have, we don't have audience response. Um, and by now you probably have made your own estimation. And when this ventricle was, when this echo was quantitated, we got an EF of 42%. So how many of you are honest to say that you were in the 40s? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> so what else can you do to help to help your eye? Okay. What other things can you do to help your eye? Well, one is just to simply do the shortening fraction, and we do that every day, right? And if you don't have big time wall motion abnormalities, a whole apex going away, or or a whole uh, inferior wall echinetic. Shortening fraction does relate to ejection fraction, and usually, you know, you want a shortening fraction of around 29 to 30 percent or better. And by the time you go under that, you tend to have a little bit of a low EF. So a 27 percent shortening fraction would be sort of a low 50s type of EF. You know, as a general thing, this is not obviously a one to one, but as a general guide. Likewise, if you quickly trace the, long, the short axis at the mid papillary level. And again, and you don't have major wall motion anomalies, particularly a whole apex going away, um, roughly a 45% shortening fraction is roughly close to a 50%. So roughly it's about five points more that you would add to the shortening fraction of the area to get the EF. Again, plus or minus, if you don't have big time wall motion abnormalities. Okay? So those are little things that you can do quickly and can help your overall uh, visual estimation, okay? This patient had a shortening fraction of 25% dimensionally, 35% um, area shortening, and actually the EF was 42% when we actually measured it. So everything fit pretty well in that there is some modest reduction of ejection fraction. If you look at the documents from the ASC, they now favor more and more measuring di dimensions front to D, which is what the way we do it in our lab, primarily because of angulation issues. That the end mode, for example, here, the, the dimension from the end mode will be coming somewhat tangential like that, and you would get a false measurement of the cavity size. So we do that every day, but in essence, you, tra you, you develop a longitude, a, the long axis of the heart, based on the angulation of the, of the image, and then you do perpendicular to that when you're doing dimensions, wall thicknesses, and so on. And there are all these values. We have some of these tables in the lab, so I'm not going to spend time in them, just to show you both basically that the dimensions and the volumes, of course, will relate to age and to gender. And when you are a big guy, like J.J. Watts, uh, he, he could very well have a dimension of six or even a little bit more than six, and it would still be within normal for his body size. But if you're a tiny little person, like some of our fellows that I'm looking at here, <laughs> uh, you would be, and you have six, you, you, you could be severe uh, enlargement. So obviously, LV size uh, have to be uh, used, and likewise, uh, gender to some degree. Volumes. <clears throat> Uh, you can do single or biplane. Of course, the, the gold standard recommender is biplane. Not always possible because you may not always get both planes to be perfect. Notice that in this image, the apex in the two chamber is pointing north, just like the four chamber. And we'll come back to that later. So you trace. And now we have traced, we have learned to trace excluding the trabeculae. And we learned that lesson very nicely from a study that I will show you later in a minute with cardiac MRI. 
And then, then you get uh, this formula, which of course you could use your pocket calculator to, to do it right. But computers don't mind this type of formulas. And in essence, what you're doing is that you're taking uh, each of these, in each of these slices, you're doing a volume. So you're doing the volume of each slice. If you do it in a single plane, the single plane assumes that this diameter will be the same on the orthogonal plane. If you do biplane, then it takes this little piece here plus this little piece here, put them together into a disk, and we'll do the volume of that disk, and then ask them all up to get the final volume. So it's a modification of Simpson's rule. It's not perfect Simpson rule, but it's a Simpson rule, Simpson's rule alike, or look alike, okay? Now, many of us don't use this, but there is an approved ASE method for lousy looking echoes. So you have an echo that you cannot all do it perfectly for different reasons, it could be quality of the image, or it could be just uh, short for shortening. But you have enough quality to get a long axis, a good long axis. And you can trace at mid-papillary level the cavity size in short axis. Then there is a very simple co a, a formula that is called bullet formula because that is the volume of a bullet. So it basically it makes the ventricle look like a bullet. And it's five, six times the area short axis times the long axis. Very simple formula. That one you could do your pocket calculator with. And that will give you an end diastolic volume. And then if you do this in for end systole, that will give you an end systolic volume. As you can imagine, it works if you don't have dramatic major regional wall motion abnormalities. So if the ventricle is diffusely bad or diffusely, or, or diffusely good, this gives you a ballpark. If the more wall motion abnormality you have, obviously, the less this is going to be an accurate way. I have shown this many times to you guys, so if I say let's all vote on the, the CF is better than 50 or less than 50, many of us, and I would be included, raise the, the arm and say, yeah, that looks like it's better than 50. You know, it looks like, you know, it's coming in nicely. If I ask you to vote now, hopefully most of you will say, uh-uh, it's less than 50. Well, look at the EKG. It's exactly the same. It's exactly the same patient. And in fact, these two images are seconds apart. Seconds apart. So it shows you the absolute Achilles tendon of echocardiography for shortening, OK? So this image is very foreshortened, which is why you see a tiny little heart, where here now you see a much bigger heart. If we measure this diameter at end diastole, it's going to be around five. Here, it's barely three. So that's our weakness, and that's the thing that we always have to be looking for. And that's one of the areas where contrast helps a lot, because you open up the heart a lot better. And remember that when you're doing parastenal long axis, any epical view, you're, caught, you're trying to cut through the center of the ventricle. OK? But quite often, we do that. So when you cut like that, the heart looks smaller, plus this wall is moving that much, and this wall is moving that much. This one is moving the same, that much. However, because you're starting now with a smaller size cavity, that same amplitude of motion now on a relative turn looks like a better EF. So the more you foreshorten, the same movement, this movement here, if I now do it, here, same movement, wow, it looks like a very good EF. Out here, that same movement, uh-uh, it's not such a good EF. So that is the main the thing, and sonographers doing echo have to pay great attention to that, and us reading the echo have to pay great attention to that. Same thing can happen, the, the other side of the coin is you can also foreshorten just by not imaging from the apex, being tangential. And the more tangential you are, the more the apex in the two chamber is going to look, is going to be out on the side. So this is not an apex then. This becomes a pseudo apex. And notice that this long axis here in the fourth chamber is a lot shorter than this long axis here. So 
you have to then reposition the transducer so that the apex in the two chamber starts getting closer to the tip of the pie, so that both are pointing up. So this is not even perfect, but it's closer. I, I could accept this for a biplane tracing. I would not be able to accept the other ones for biplane tracings. Now, if the heart is moving a lot because the patient is going <sighs> or because it's a post-op, you, you can end up with this. You might be okay in diastole, by systole, you're for shortening. How do you know that? Your short axis is you. So always pay attention in the short axis how much translation you see. And very easy to know that. If you put your mouth in the center of the cavity in diastole, and there is no translation, the end systole should have roughly the same point of the center point. Here you can see very nicely that it's not. That if I put the uh, mouse at the center in diastole, systole is moving all the way. So it's very easy for you to help yourself with the mouse and know that there is significant, the more translation you see, the more beware in the apical views of the dangers of foreshortening. So these are the recommendations that are given for properly obtaining a good, uh, a good recording of the left ventricle by 2D, and this is a big one. And that's why every echo lab in the country, hopefully, has a mattress cut so that the sonora effect can go way down into the real apex, because the PMI that we feel when we examine a patient is not LV apex, shown very nicely. 30 plus years ago, simultaneous LV angiography and 2D echo were done. And you could, you could get the, the image of the 2D, and then you would see where the, the transducer was positioned, in the, and you have the LV angio, and you could see that the transducer was actually not even close to the apex of the LV, and then they repositioned it, and then they showed the transducer right at the apex. That was done in the very early days of 2D echo. Beautiful study showing that what we feel as an apical impulse is not LV apex. So first step before you make any measurements, and that's true for anything, left atrial size, anything, right ventricle, look at all the images and then decide on the proper clips for you to look at. And therefore the preview system that we have with our DGView is fantastic because you can look quickly through the preview and then go to those clips that you believe have the best cut for measuring. So which clip would you select here? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, right? <laughs> However, I could ask you the same question now, and now you have some choices. Huh? You have a lot of choices. In fact, you can even, there's, it's, the choices are so good that you can even uh, take one of them and trace and get a nice uh, volume and EF. And not only do you get beautiful global function, which is hyperdynamic, but you have some cavity obliteration and you have a little bit of the tip of the apex that is a kinetic right there, just, just the tip. So obviously this shows the value of contrast, which in this lab we all know very well, but it's interesting that the rest of the world doesn't. The utilization of contrast in this country is still pretty low. So uh, this is not a terrible image, and in fact it was good enough to trace, and we got um, end story volume of 200 and EF of 35%. However, when contrast was given, 200 became 235, and 35 became 26. And I think even your eye will see that this is not such a good ventricle. Very important if you're making decisions for you know, ICDs, for uh, prognosis, for all kinds of things. So that's why, again, the bigger the hearts, the more contrast can help you. This was the other classic paper that came out years back now from the Mayo Clinic where they did um, CT as the um, gold standard. And without contrast, yeah, there was a good correlation. But a, three, a three, 250 cc's endastolic ventricle would have not even 150 by 2D. So significant underestimation of volumes. When contrast was given, they almost were in the line of identity, very close to the line of identity. So 
these are the official recommendations. Contrast agents should be used when needed to improve endocardial delineation, and you all, you all know that very, very well. This was another great paper that was uh, came out in 2009 from our lab with uh, Dr. Zagbi as a senior author. Mustafa Kurt was a great fellow we had in those days. We did over 600 patients where we did them with and without contrast, but we called the attending physician and gave them the results without the contrast first and said, what would you do next with this information? And we made a note of that and said, okay, now let me tell you what we did. We gave contrast and now this is what we found. What do you think, how do you think this would change your management of the patient? And basically there were significant changes in EF in 17%, new one motion normality picked up in 28% and we avoided additional studies in a third of patients. Okay, so back to the document. This is just some of the tables that, that we can have in our lab. This is telling you the ranges for normal, mild, moderate, severe, severely uh, for uh, enlargement of the LV, okay, diameters, and for volumes, okay. So by echo, anything over 200 is severely abnormal. By CMR, 200 would be at most mild. So even, you know, even with everything, we still tend to do less than CMR. Now, these are numbers without contrast, without contrast, because most of the world is not using contrast. So these are numbers with 2D without contrast, and clearly our ranges are much less than what you would get on a CMR. So again, these are the normal values um, for, uh, based on, for, for volumes based on body surface area and so on. On the other hand, EF doesn't change much. It's about the same, no matter what. And this is what's recommended for going from mild, moderate to severe. We're sort of, we still haven't totally adapted that. As you know, we have a, a mild to moderate range that we use in the, in the low 40s. We have a moderate up to 35 and moderate to severe. So we kind of alter a little bit of that, although we are not that far away. Under 30, we all agree, we say severe. Um, Dr. Naga is going to talk more about the Doppler hemodynamics, but in the business of getting to the echo stroke volume quantitation, it helps a lot to do a good stroke volume by Doppler because the, in the absence of MR or AI, the 2D stroke volume should be similar to this. So as you're learning, this becomes a good internal control for you to compare the stroke volume by 2D with the stroke volume by Doppler in the absence of significant MR or AI. So it's a good thing to have. Uh, this is just for historical reasons. This was the original paper where this method was put on the map by Dr. Lewis in our lab back in the 80s, before Dr. Sobby was a fellow. So um, 3D, 3D is a good method. The advantage of 3D that partially can help with foreshortening because you can align your planes so you can correct, you can go properly align and then end up with this and if you then put your, uh, identify your annular points and the apex, the system takes over and gives you the volumes. And when well done, you can get very nice results. 158 and that's totally volume, stroke volume of 95, EF 60%. Again, like any method, the problems are image quality for shortening. So this was the classic study that was done, multi-center, that's why this study is so good. Multi-center comparing the 3D with the CMR, very good correlations, very good. But still, a 300 cc ventricle by CMR was only 220 by 3D echo. Then they learned, using that, they went back and reassessed, and they learned that the 2D could be improved if you eliminated the trabeculae and went way out. And that's why today we tend to trace now more generously when we're doing the tracings because of what was learned with this study. And then the data became closer when the trabeculation was excluded. And, and that's what contrast do, see? When you give contrast, it fills the whole cavity. And now you trace, and you're tracing really the cavity, and you're not you know, tracing trabeculations. So that's one of the advantages of contrast. So that was the lesson learned, and, and that I think it has helped us now do a better job. Again, these are normal values that, that we hopefully have them hanging in the walls. Um, these are for um, 3D volumes. So it has its own set of normal ranges when you use 3D. 
Limitations, basically, we all see it every day in the lab, quality of images. Importantly, if you don't do this well, you may take an inaccurate result and you may make a wrong decision. So that's, this is the biggest thing because the more automatic these methods are, if you believe them without using your brain and your eyes to review the images, you make a note and you report it. And then that's where the problem can exist. All right? So that's the problem. How do we report a study with a normal EF by eyeball uh, or 2D who has abnormal by 3D? Or vice versa. It could be vice versa. All right, so a few words about speckle tracking. We're doing more and more about it. Uh, as you know, you take uh, the, it's a digital technique. It's using the, the matrix of, uh, of digitization. It's taking a pixel and following the movement of that pixel throughout the cardiac cycle. So you have now hundreds or thousands of these little pixels that you are following, and then that can be put together in multiple views. So you can do circumferential and radial shortening, and you can do longitudinal shortening in the ethical views. The longitudinal shortening is the one that have picked up more clinical use than the others, A, because it seems to be more affected by different diseases. You tend to lose longitudinal function before you lose circumferential function. So looking for sensitive markers, uh, longitudinal has become more popular. So this is a lousy heart. The eye would say it. But what's interesting is that I would read this as a diffuse global depression. And yet when you do the, the strain, you see that there are some areas that are hypokinetic some are even severely hypokinetic, and some are almost dyskinetic when you look at this train. So actually, this train not only gives you the whole global picture, but also helps you dissect through the regions. And when we talk later about regional one motion, we will be bringing, bringing this back and discussing it further. So what is normal? So normal, after uh, putting a lot of experts together in a consensus and looking at variation between machines and everything else, it's been agreed that greater than minus 17, which is a real pain in the neck, because it means minus 16. So I would prefer to eliminate the freaking sign and say, you know, anything less than 17. But, you know, because it's a minus uh, parameter, then it's greater than, which is, to me, is very confusing for general pra practitioners. So this guy has a hyperdynamic cavity obliteration super hard with a 95% EGF, typical guy with hypertension and LVH. And yet, this strain is pretty low, 14 global and also regional changes. So this is just shows you the ability of strain to go further into the myocardium and tell us more about myocardial function, even though the patient may still have a very good ejection fraction. And that's where the money is right now. That's where thousands of papers are coming out every year. Okay, is detection of subclinical LV dysfunction. And the list keeps getting longer and longer and longer. You know about chemotherapy, it's one of the areas that, that um, is being explored, but the, this list keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So obviously you still need to, you need to have this, which I think by now we have agreed that 17 is sort of your low limit cutoff, and below that we call it depressed, and beyond that we say normal. Of all the papers out there, I think this is a good one for you guys to review. This was very uh, recent. This came out in uh, either this year or last year. Uh, it's in here somewhere. 2018, yeah, so it, it was the beginning of 2018. It's a review article, but it's also like they summarize a lot of data from the literature. And, and the bottom line here, the point they're making is that when we look at radiation fraction for prediction of mortality in cardiac patients, when you get here, nobody argues. You're out here looking good, but then you have this red region where things change very slowly, very little, a lot of scatter. And what's that area? 35 to 53, 54. That middle range that we call mild to moderate depression, low limits, you know, that is not so clear. And lo and behold, when they look at the meta-analysis of 5,700 patients, that was where the money was. So here, strain didn't do much, 
and this is one motion score. So this is looking at EF. So this middle range, over 35%, that's where the money was. That's where the money was in terms of strain, adding something extra to predict the outcome of the patient. And I think that's where we are going gradually with the use of strain. So they have this nice picture in their, in their uh, paper where they basically talk about normal EF, a few patients are down here, but the majority are, are somewhere here. Down here, everybody's bad. This middle range is where with a given EF, you, put, you could have a strain that is only mildly or borderline, or you could have a really bad strain. Likewise here, you could have an EF of 52, but with a strain of 13. So this is the area that, that they're pointing as being the region of interest for more research in terms of the pivot, this question, because this is the question that is really important, right? So if we use strain in top of somebody with an EF of 47%, and we identify a higher risk, what can we do differently? What would we, what would we do differently with that patient, knowing that information, versus what we would have done just with the EF of 48 or 49% or 52%? And that's the question. And that's the question that has to be answered going forward so that we can really start learning how to use strain from a clinically practical point of view, okay? Limitations, not that different from 3D. Quality, you know, if the image sucks, you won't get a good signal and we cannot use contrast. So right now, contrast cannot be applied for either strain or 3D, which would be great if it could. Uh, I know that there are companies working on that. Um, Inaccurate results may be incorrectly accepted. So you get an EF of 65%, but you get a strain of 13, and you put this big, big statement on the report and make everybody scared, and maybe it was just inaccurate data. So they're still having to deal with how do we manage that. Reproducibilities are still an issue, particularly with, between machines. And remember, it is altered by loading conditions. It's not 100% a measurement of contractility. And back to the clinical question, how do we treat a patient that has normal EF but impaired training? Okay, so I hope you get something out of this and go back to the lab and at least pay attention to those very important points I made about foreshortening, because that is really the, if you take something home, take that one. Uh, try to maybe use some of the clues I told you for improving the eye estimation, quantitate whenever you can, and uh, for the sonographers, please have a very low threshold for contrast because it really helps. So we'll ask Dr. Naga now to take us through the hemodynamics, and I guess you'll have to put your own little, uh, so let me come out of here and close this. Flip it, yeah, and I'll be happy to do it. This? Okay. Um, so, talking about flows and pressure gradients, that's the second part of this presentation. Uh, we'll start with the flows, but there is more to sort of understanding the flows in terms of the hydrodynamics and the principles behind it. 
Uh, also good that people are aware of units of what is being measured. So pressure, these are the SI units. Uh, and it is the Pascal, how you can obtain pressure for fluid. It depends on its density, the volume, and the free fall acceleration. Um, and remember this, that some fluids are denser than others, so a shorter length, if you would, of a fluid in a container will exert similar pressure to a longer length. So if you want to convert centimeters water to millimeters mercury, that's the conversion you have. Okay. Uh, we'll skip through viscosity and Poisset's law. The general principles of Poisset's law you should know, and basically the flow is related to the fourth power of the radius, the pressure gradient, and inversely related to the length of the tube through which the flow is happening and the viscosity as well. Um, there are some assumptions that one applies in working with the Poisset's law. Most of these assumptions do not result in a major problem when you use the Poisset's approach with the exception of the issue of inelastic tubes because Poisset's law assumes that you are going through a tube that doesn't change as the flow goes through it. As you know, this is not the case for blood vessels. And also it's dealing with steady flow whereas flow in the cardiovascular system is pulsatile and so it is much more accurate to look at differential equations if you're looking at these as opposed to the single equation we just looked at. We'll move through these and we'll move through Reynolds number and we'll start with flow. So one easy way of remembering flow is to say flow represents the volume of a cylinder. And so the volume of a cylinder is given as the product of the area and the length of that cylinder. Then comes the assumption, what do you think the cross-sectional area is? If you assume it's a circle, then it's the circle equation of the area and then the velocity enters in place of that length. Why the velocity? Because we are looking over for flow over a period of time. And then if you measure the velocity, you are able to quantify flow. This is, say, centimeters squared. This is centimeters per second. So the final units will be centimeter cubed per second. If you assume it's a circle, then it's the radius squared. If you assume it is a, an ellipse, and in some places in the cardiovascular system, for example, the mitral valve, it is more accurate to think of it as an ellipse as opposed to a circle, then you use that second approach. So that's a fundamental equation that you need to know. Uh, so we quantify flow, it's good to sort of step back and say, where can I make mistakes? The biggest error is in the diameter measurement, the place where we are measuring the diameter. For example, if I'm quantifying flow through the outflow tract, did I measure the diameter of the outflow tract correctly or not? This is the biggest problem. Then comes the issue of geometric assumption. We just said it's either a circle or an ellipse, and this is an oversimplification. Turns out, despite that, most of the time, no serious errors, major errors, come from this assumption. We talked about a phasic flow in an instantaneous area here. So we are assuming that that area is constant during the duration of systole, say, or during the duration of diastole, if you're looking at flow for across the mitral valve. That area is not always constant, it actually changes. Further, if you change the amount of flow through the orifice, that orifice area can get larger. This is the principle behind looking at aortic valve area as you increase flow in patients with low ejection fraction and you have gradients that are low, but nevertheless a valve area that comes to a small value need to think of the appropriate site of measurement. Flow and velocity should be measured at the same level, but if you end up measuring velocity at a location where the area is not measured at, then they do not match. Also, it would be best if we are able to use areas by themselves instead of this geometric assumption and calculations. With 3D, it is possible to do that as well. So. The take-home message from that slide if asked about errors in the measurement is to focus on the LV outflow tract uh, 
say, diameter or the diameter error in measurement. A frequent question that gets asked, so the diameter is measured incorrectly, what does that do to the area measurement? Most people say it's the diameter squared, so it's a square uh, likewise error. Turns out, no, this is a simple approach to show you. You do not need to go through it, but basically the error in the area is twice the error in the diameter measurement. Can be costly when you're looking at small diameters, for example, in the uh, neonatal period as opposed to adults. But nevertheless, if you're looking, say, at an actual diameter of 1.8 that gets measured as 2, that's a serious error and will result in errors in flow and anything else that you are using from that flow. How about velocity measurements? Velocity measurements can also be problematic. The first assumption that we use is we are measuring flow in one plane and we're saying this is the flow that goes through that region. If you think about it from 3D, flow is a vector and it has components in all different directions that you can think and choose of. It would be most accurate if you are able to get that true vector, not the projection of the vector in one direction only. Uh, also, we need to look at the spectrum profile, and we'll take a look at that. Sometimes you have denser signals, sometimes you have a fainter signal within the same acquisition. Which one you measure can make a difference. We already touched about the signal strength and the 3D vectors. The non-simultaneous nature of area and velocity measurements becomes problematic when you're looking at individuals with arrhythmias, individuals with uh, atrial fibrillation, for example, and then the assumption of continuity. What does that mean? For example, I'm going to measure flow at the level of the aorta, but it's above the level of the coronary arteries. And I will use this measurement to say this is a reflection of the true cardiac output that crossed the aortic valve. You would say, no, it is not a correct reflection of the cardiac output because some amount of that flow has already left the aortic root and gone through the coronary circulation. How do we quantify stroke volume? You've seen the example with Dr. Kenyonis. We'll go over that. Also, if you want to get the time velocity integral, you can do it on the systems. In the older days, you can also say it's a triangle and then that's how you get the area of triangle, have base times height. If you, I know stroke volume, I know heart rate, I know cardiac output. This was used in the 90s to look at the effect of different drugs. For example, the positive inotropic drugs, what do they do to the cardiac output, different pacing modes, AV sequential pacing, varying AV delays, and also has surfaced again with CRT, the most labs and most electrophysiologists don't aggressively seek these protocols except in certain scenarios. You can use it to look at physiological changes in flow and cardiac output, in fetuses during pregnancy with exercise, and collectively can give you a part of a comprehensive assessment of what the cardiovascular system does in these situations. These are applications for shunts, uh, valve regurgitation, valve area, and you heard about the application in ejection fraction. Ideally, when you go for measuring flow through the LV outflow tract, you want to zoom. The reason you zoom is you make less errors, less costly errors when you zoom as opposed to an area where, or a situation where an image without zooming is used. And this is where we put it at the insertion sites for the leaflet, for the aortic valve leaflets. In this case, it's 2.37, and as you expect, larger ventricles, larger individuals will have larger diameters. And then we go for flow through the LV outflow tract. You want to be well aligned. There should be no angulation. You should have one click, but not both clicks. These signals are flow from the mitral valve that makes its way during diastole through the LV outflow tract. So that's an E, that's an A. Remember, these are diastolic signals, so when you are tracking the time velocity integral or the peak velocity, this is the signal that you want to focus on. You can also get flow through the RV outflow tract, flow through the pulmonary artery, and you get the RV outflow tract diameter, and then also you get flow by pulse wave Doppler.
why pulse wave? Because I want to measure flow specifically at that location. So high pulse repetition frequency should not be used for the objective of measuring flows. And then you get that time velocity integral, you multiply it by the cross-sectional area and you're able to get flows and of course with heart rate you get cardiac output. The biggest error for RV outflow tract is recognizing that outer wall of the outflow tract or of the pulmonary artery if you're looking at pulmonary artery flows. And in the earlier days when they were looking at validating these measurements, they noted that if they used the RV outflow tract diameter from a ventricular gram of the right ventricle, they get closer values to what a PA catheter cardiac output does. Also need to get mitral flows. We get them at the level of the annulus and at the level of the tips. The tips is not used for flows, but for diastolic function. The annulus one is the one that you use for quantifying the flows. Notice the variation, so that has also to be accounted for. Ideally, you can ask the patient to hold their breath at end expiration and use these signals to do it. If you have a patient who cannot do that, then you will need to average. The more the averaging, the closer you are to reality. And sinus rhythm, three beats would be enough. Then the principles of using flow to quantify mitral regurg. So during systole, the blood leaves the left ventricle, and if there is no MR, all of it will go through the LV outflow tract. But because of mitral regurg, some will go back and some will go through the LV outflow tract. Therefore, if I know the total stroke volume, the difference between end diastole and end systole, this is equal to aortic flow plus mitral regurg. And so mitral regurg is quantified as the difference between stroke volume and aortic flow. As simple as it is, because you are seeing here the need for multiple measurements, they can come with their own errors and they can lead obviously to final errors in the MR volume that is sought. Example of a case of mitral regurg with a flail segment and eccentric jet directed anteromedially by color and you will get into that later on. You can say this is a sizable MR. It is not an insignificant MR. Let us say we want to go through the quantification of that. So I get the mitral annulus diameter, it should be during diastole. And which frame you choose, remember we said that the mitral annulus area is not a constant, it changes throughout diastole, so it opens wider and then the leaflets gradually will come back till they close at end diastole, after left atrial contraction. You do not take the widest, typically it's the third frame or so that you choose. And you are basically making the assumption that this is a temporal average of what is happening to the mitral annulus area. If you are able to get flow at each time point and match it with each area and then integrate these equations, then you would be able to sort of circumvent all these assumptions. By the way, despite that being an assumption, it was validated as you saw in one of the studies that Dr. Quinones showed and it did very well when compared to stroke volume by a PA catheter. Then we get the mitral annulus time velocity integral. We get the LV outflow tract zoomed. We get the diameter and then we get the time velocity integral through the outflow tract. And there are the values that you see for each one of them. And for the mitral valve volume, the volume that crosses the mitral valve during diastole, this is what we get. It's 113 cc's. The aortic stroke volume is less. Why is the aortic stroke volume is less? Because some of that 2D stroke volume that you saw, that 113 is going back through the mitral valve to the left atrium during systole, and that's the difference between them. And expressed as a fraction, that's what you get. So that's an application of this flow equation and you will see other applications to it as you go through the series this year. How about aortic regurg? You can also look for aortic regurg and you can quantify it the same way. There is the flow through the LV outflow tract. This is the aortic wave Doppler. AR 
signal by pulse wave Doppler, there is RV outflow tract, and there is the volume that crosses the LV outflow tract, and that's the volume that crosses the RV outflow tract. Why is the volume more that crosses the LV outflow tract? Because of the aortic regurg. And so the difference between them is the regurgitant volume, and you go ahead and get a regurgitant fraction. Uh, We'll talk quickly about energy pressure and flow. Can we measure energy or can we measure work by echocardiography? Yes, you can. You can also measure it by cath. For fluids, the, the basic definition of energy is capacity to do work. For solid objects, it's force multiplied by distance. Remember, now we're talking fluids, so we have to change that to pressure multiplied by area multiplied by distance, so this becomes volume. Therefore, when you think of fluids and you want to think of work and energy, it's the product of pressure and volume. So if you have pressure volume loops, the areas of these pressure volume loops represent the work done by the ventricle uh, where you obtain these loops from. Another expression that is important for us is looking at kinetic energy and potential energy for fluids. So similar to what you do in solid objects. It's mass multiplied by velocity squared over two, and mass is density times volume. This is a constant, so in other words, if I know the volume of blood crossing that particular area and I know the velocity, then I can quantify the kinetic work. For the potential energy, it's the product of the density, the volume, the free fall acceleration. These are constants, so again, it depends on the volume and the location where you are measuring that flow. H refers to the height above the center of gravity. Bernoulli's law simply stated is the energy is conserved. So the energy at point one is the same as the energy at point two as any other point along this path. Bernoulli's law sort of sets the stage for the continuity equation. Basically, flow at point one is the same at flow as po at point two. And we just said flow is given as the product of area and velocity. And so you have these two sides that are equal. If you are interested in A1 or A2, you simply rearrange it and you will get that area. That's the continuity equation principle. You can also readily look at this and say this is a narrow segment and therefore the area is smaller. To keep this equal to the left-hand side, then the velocity has to be much higher and it follows that the kinetic energy at this point is higher than that. But remember, the total energy is the same, assuming no friction losses, which is a big assumption. That's the full energy equation, and it shows you the pressure volume product, it shows you the kinetic energy component, and it shows you the potential energy component. And again, if we're looking at these two points, they are equal, you rearrange this expression, you end up with the pressure gradient being given as half multiplied by density, so that is constant, and then immediately it's V2 squared minus V1 squared. When V2 is much higher than V1, you can ignore V1 from that calculation, and so this is where you end up with half density V2 squared. Now this is in absolute or in standard SI units. We are all familiar with the millimeter mercury, so this shows you the derivation, I won't go through it, but basically this is why pressure ends up being equal 4V squared. This is in millimeters mercury and velocity is in meters per second. But it is an assumption. What are the limitations? There are limitations in that we ignore the components of the friction loss. There are also limitations in that there is energy that is needed to sort of accelerate a blood from rest or to bring the motion of the blood to a stop if that blood is moving, and we tend to ignore that term. Not a big problem in the absence, say, of a case of mitral stenosis, but when you're looking at stenotic valves, that term is not to be ignored and results in an oversimplification. The easiest thing for you to remember and to be able to correct for, for is that last bullet point. When you do the Bernoulli equation, if you see a proximal velocity that exceeds 1.5 meter per second, do not ignore V1. It has to be accounted for. 
what are the applications for pressure gradients? So you can get PA pressures, we get gradients across stenotic valves, we get gradients across prosthetic valves, you can look at intracavitary gradients, you can do calculations as DP, DT from MR jets or TR jets, you can estimate LV and diastolic pressure, you can estimate LA pressure from MR jets. The last two have their own limitations, but conceptually they make sense and therefore will be covered briefly. That's the TR assumption, you get the peak TR velocity, 4V squared is equal to the pressure gradient between the RV and the RA, and since there is no pulmonic stenosis, RV systolic pressure is the same as the PA systolic pressure, and that's the equation we all use. Remember that if there is pulmonic stenosis, that RV systolic pressure exceeds the pressure in the pulmonary artery and you have to account for the gradient across the pulmonic valve or the RV outflow tract if it's a subvalvular obstruction. PR velocity is a useful velocity for the PA diastolic and mean pressure. We'll talk more about the PA diastolic in this presentation. You care for the end diastolic velocity and that's the expression we use. Again, delta P, the pressure between the PA diastolic pressure and RV end diastolic pressure is four multiplied by V squared. The V we care for is the end diastolic velocity and you rearrange this expression to estimate the PA diastolic pressure, that's what you get. Word of caution, because end diastolic velocities are typically small values, so you will look at one, 1 1.5, two if it gets really high may reach a three. In most of the cases that we see, the end diastolic velocity r runs in the lower ranges, and so the accuracy depends heavily on a correct estimation of RAP. So if you start with an RAP assumption of 10 to all cases, you'll tend to overcool PA diastolic pressures in many situations. Example of an aortic stenosis jet that you get from the suprasternal notch, as you see here. Example of a mitral stenosis jet, notice the velocity in early and late diastole are both more than two meters per second. So this is a case of severe mitral stenosis. I know you will cover that later on. This is, these are signals taken at the same time by Doppler as well as by an LV and LA catheter. Notice how faithfully the gradients are represented here. A mean of 10 corresponding to a mean of 10, and you can go each of these. Why there is beat-to-beat -beat variation? Because of the AFib. And you can see that the beat-to-beat -beat variation is present in the pressure recording as well as in the Doppler recording. So if you are well aligned with the flow, you should have the same value as you would get by a cath in this scenario. Example of a dynamic gradient here in someone with LV outflow tract obstruction and you have a peak velocity of six, you apply the modified Bernoulli equation and it's a 4V squared, it's a 144. Example of a DP, DT from MR jets. We do not do this routinely, but in research settings and it is expected that people who would be, say, at least level two echocardiography would be expected to know how this is done. Basically, you want a delta P and you want delta T. So you fix two points. One corresponds to one meter per second, say the other is two meters per second, or one meter per second and three meters per second in this situation. So the delta P here, when you do the 4V squared, is 32 millimeters mercury, and then you just measure the time interval between them. This is where most of the error comes in that situation. You can also use it qualitatively. Take a look at how this MR jet is rising. Does it rise slowly? Does it rise fast? That corresponds to a rapid rise in LV pressure. And the same can be done for the TR jet. That's an example for an LV and diastolic pressure estimation. So you need an aortic regurg signal. It should be complete. Remember what we said about the PR end diastolic velocity for PA diastolic pressure, you want the end diastolic velocity here for LV end diastolic pressure. And then you set up the equation diastolic plus pressure minus EDP is given by 4V squared, so if this V is 3.6, it follows that EDP is equal to 18 millimeters mercury. There are several assumptions here. One is that the diastolic blood pressure that you get by a cuff, say, measurement over the brachial artery is the same.
that is in the root of the aorta, which is not true. Also notice that we are ending up with the velocity squared here. So a 3.3, 3.2, as opposed to a 3.6 can give you big differences here. And the smaller that velocity becomes, the greater the EDP is and the errors in overcalling elevated EDP. So I'll stop here and we can take questions. So, for, for strain or EF, PVT, um, as far as I know, they're all really low dependent. There isn't really an echo based. Method. That's the correct answer, man. I think that the traditional measurements we all do daily, they're all low dependent. Yeah. Yeah. If you wanted to go to load independence, then you would have to get into some more research measurements like, for example, elastans, which is the NC-story pressure volume, and you have, you know, very sophisticated, or even peak DPDT, which is the closest we have in the CAS lab, if we put a micromanometer to get a quote-unquote measurement of contractile function, even that one, I showed as a fellow that it was low-dependent. So it's very hard to get something that is not low-dependent. Low but the stuff that we normally do every day, right, it's all low-dependent. Yeah. Even strain it has been shown very nicely. You know, strain is myocardial, but even in the myocardium, you know, you're going to have effects of loads. So even that one is low-dependent. So you, you need pressure volume loops to be able to get to these load-independent indices, and there are three indices you can get for the pressure volume loops. One of them is the N-systolic elastins. There are equations that can use single beat measurements from echocardiography to get this end systolic elastins. One study validated it, and some use it, but it's cumbersome and mostly for research mostly purposes. For research. Yeah. There is preload recruitable stroke work, and then there is the slope of end diastolic volume and DPDT. Yeah. Any other questions? Good. Okay. Thank you.